we've got this next chapter, the circulation. Now, I've separated the circulation, this is blood vessels, but I separate them to two separate things. This is the lecture portion, which is basically the physiology. I'm going to talk about blood pressure, I'm going to talk about resistance and blood flow, that actual physiology. The names of the blood vessels themselves, if I said the brachial artery or the axillary artery, those names are in a totally different PowerPoint, which is really the laboratory section. We'll start that um, actually on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to start off by doing uh, all the blood vessels. Of, my goal is to get all the blood vessels above the diaphragm uh, out for you. And whatever I don't finish, I'll do it on the following day. Um, so the names of them. It's kind of like the way you had AMP1. AMP1, the physiology of bones and how they ossify and stuff, that's all lecture stuff. But the actual names of the bones, the femur, the trochanter, uh, greater trochanter, those parts of, was actually done in lab. Does that make sense? So that's what we do over here. So we're going to start the lecture portion over here, and it'll take us a few days to go through it. Um, but next time we meet, we're going to do the uh, uh, the lab portion. We're going to start that up. All right, so I give you something to do for the weekend. I don't want you to be too bored on the weekend. I already have people coming up to me saying, "We're bored. There's nothing to do." No, no one's coming. In. <laughs> Not for your class. I don't want you to start beating up your own classmates. Like, what are you telling him? I mean, we don't want it. So, um, but there's a lot of, as you know, in AP1, there's a lot of material, so I want to space it out. Okay, right, so um, lecture portion, all right? So the peripheral circulation, we've already did the central circulation, that's the heart and lungs, and you've done all that with the blood flow through the heart and the pulmonary, and, and, uh, pulmonary arteries and veins. But what about throughout the rest of the body? So, you know, it's gonna carry blood, it's gonna obviously exchange nutrients from the blood to the cells and backwards, uh, cells, to the, uh, um, cells to the blood. Um, it's going to transport hormones, and I know you guys love those hormones, right? Because they're going to be passing through all those. Um, and other uh, molecules that will help with coagulation, talk about um, uh, the clotting factors and stuff, the waste product. It's also going to help regulate blood pressure, and we're going to talk about that probably not so much today, but um, in the next uh, couple of sessions. And it's going to help direct blood flow. Hey, if you're running a marathon, you don't need to be digesting your food. Uh, when you're running a marathon. You want the blood to be shunted away from your intestines to go to places you need it, i.e. your skeletal muscles. So we're going to talk about shunning blood and how to do that. Now the, basically there's three different blood vessel types. And we talked about two major ones, the veins and the arteries. But there's subtypes of those. For instance, arteries, as you know, always carry blood to the heart, right? Away. Away, there you go. All right. It always carries blood away from the heart. And that's pretty easy to memorize, right? Arteries with an A and away with an uh, away. But there's three different types. There's elastic, muscular, and an arterial, okay? Um, and we'll get through these also. But in essence, uh, elastic are going to be the ones closest to the heart, the one that's going to sustain the most blood pressure. If your heart is going to pump a, a big bolus of blood, the first blood vessel is going to sustain a large blood pressure. So it's going to have to expand and then shrink right back down, right? It's going to expand with that big bolus of blood going in it, but then it has to, it has a lot, a lot of elastic fibers to bring it back down or recoil to its original site. So that's where it's going to be. But further on down the road, there's not going to be that much elastic in the blood vessels because the blood pressure has been diminished. All right, muscular areas, we'll talk about those, they're going to withstand a high pressure too, but um, they're also going to help with vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And then eventually gets very small, and we talk into arterioles, which kind of is the smallest set of uh, arteries, uh, we call them arterioles, before it becomes capillaries. After capillaries, then we go back to what we call veins, and veins always carry blood to the heart. And we have a set of different ones on there too. Um, there are thinner walls than, uh, than the arteries. And the best way I can explain the difference between the two, think of an artery as a garden hose. And you see how a garden hose is? It's, it, you, could, you could shape it, but it kind of sh it has a memory to its shape, right? You could, you could bend it, but it goes right back to what it is when you let go of it. And it's very thick. Um, the veins are more like a fire hose, where there's less flexibility, it has more flexibility. Um, if you just let it sit there, it'll contort to whatever shape you want, right? There's less elastic fibers in there, so to say. So the three different types that we have is uh, the venules, which is the smallest blood vessel, or the smallest veins going from the capillaries back to the veins. 
And then you've got things that are small things, and then we also group medium and large veins together because they're very similar. So we put that together. Um, also, veins are going to have a problem getting blood back to the heart. You see, if I take a bowling ball, okay, and I take a bowling ball and I roll it down here, the highest pressure is going to be right where the bowling ball is, right? You wouldn't want to get hit by a bowling ball that's that close where it just came off my hand, right? There's a lot of pressure there. But gradually, as the ball is rolling, it loses its pressure, does it not? And by the time you get to the very end, you've lost all that pressure. So it's the same way as blood leaving the heart, and it's got a long passageway to get back to the heart. Does that make sense? So it gradually the blood pressure goes down. So let me ask you this, and listen to the multiple choice. Where is the lowest blood pressure found? Just listen to the, the choices first, and I'll go through it again. The lowest blood pressure, is it found in the aorta, arteries of the arms, arteries, oh, I'm sorry, let me start over. Aorta, arteries of the arms, veins of the arms, arteries of the legs, veins of the legs, or the inferior vena cava, or right atrium. Okay? Let me repeat it again. Who here thinks that the high... I mean, you don't have to show your hands. You can just go like this. So I have an idea. So if you don't worry about other people so they're thinking like, why is he thinking that? Or what? Just go like this. So I have an idea. I'm going to see this. Okay? Who here thinks the high, the lowest blood pressure is in the aorta? Arteries of the arm. Veins of the arm. Arteries of the legs. Veins of the legs. Inferior vena cava slash right atrium. I'm not saying when the right atrium contracts, I'm just saying as the blood flows down the right atrium. Okay, we're seeing a lot of people uh, picking the veins of the legs. That's wrong, all right? The lowest blood pressure is at the very end of the passageway, which is going to be the inferior vena cava or the right atrium for that matter. If the lowest blood pressure was down by our legs, the blood would stay there, would it not? So there must be something, some kind of blood pressure bringing it back up to the heart. So it couldn't be. Most people are thinking the legs because that's the furthest part from the heart, let alone that's where gravity is. Sure, it's low down there, but not as low, by, not as, low as when it reaches the right atrium. So the right atrium has the lowest blood pressure. Does it make sense? When you throw a bowling ball, even though the bowling ball may be over here, the low, blood pressure is low, but it's not as low as what it is at the very end. So you've got to look at this whole cycle. All right? So we're going to have ways, because gradually the blood pressure goes down, there's going to be ways to get the blood up from the, from the legs. There is some blood pressure there, higher than what it is in, in the right atrium, but we have other mechanisms to make sure that the blood is going in that trajectory. For instance, the veins in the legs have valves. So valves are going to ensure one-way blood flow. Once the blood passes that valve, it won't go back down just the way you saw the valves in the heart. So we have valves in there. We're going to also have muscles in our legs to help as we walk. The muscles in our legs, the, uh, the skeletal muscles, are going to help milk the blood upwards. And I'll show you what that looks like in a picture. So we have mechanisms to help bring it back up, but it's still extremely low in the right atrium. Hint, hint. Understand that concept. It'll be a question in the exam. Okay? And then we have the capillaries which is basically the one uh, layer of uh, blood vessels where oxygen and, ga oxygen and carbon dioxide pass over each other. Whether it's in the lungs where oxygen is going to come onto the bloodstream and carbon dioxide goes off, or in the cells throughout your whole body where oxygen comes off and carbon dioxide comes back on, i.e. gas exchange. There's a few different capillaries there too. So this is just a schematic view of the circulatory system. This is your arteries over here. They go smaller into arterioles. Then you've got thin one-layered uh, blood vessels here called capillaries. 
They start turning blue because oxygen is coming off of it. So then it turns into venules, eventually goes into veins. And you could also see a wonderful valve there, uh, which would occur in the, uh, in the veins also. Okay? So generalized structure of blood vessels. There's three tunics. tunics. It's a fancy word for layers. Okay? So we have three layers in arteries and veins. We call it tunica inter interma, uh, inter sorry, interna, media, and externa. So the more inner one will be interna, the middle one is media, and the outer is externa. Okay? Um, the lumen, as you know, the lumen is where the blood flow goes to, that cavity through the blood vessel. Right? You have a garden hose, water goes through the lumen of the garden hose, blood goes through the lumen of the, um, of the blood vessel there. Okay? And capillaries is composed of this endothelial layer, which is simple squamous epithelium, uh, and it's very uh, small basal lamina, which I'll explain, very small amount of connective tissue around there. Okay? But you would expect it to be very thin, so that gas exchange could happen. You don't want to have a lot of layers there because then gas exchange, oxygen has to pass through all those many layers. Uh, again, uh, physiology reflects anatomy, or function reflects uh, structure, okay? So this is basically a schematic view um, of the um, artery versus the vein. Again, here's the artery, more like a garden hose, much thicker, much more elastic fibers in there. Whereas the lumen of the vein, or the vein itself, is much bigger, as you would see in a, um, a fire hose, but you can see the wall is much thinner on that, okay? And there's different layers over here, all right? Um, you can see over here, just with an artery, you can see the muscular layer is much thicker than the muscular layer in the vein, all right? Um, all right, so... Let me just go over these really quickly for you. Um, it's more like you have to just sit down and just look at this stuff, but I'll go over and just point out some uh, um, highlights on here. The tunica interna, all right, also called tunica uh, intima, that has the endothelial lining. That's a simple squamous epithelium. That's the part that's going to line the lumen, okay? There's a basic membrane there, and then we have something called the lamina propria, which is basically connective tissue to hold the whole thing together, okay? There will also be um, an elastic membrane there to help with the recoiling action to go back to its um, straight, straight side. So uh, intima is over here. You can see the picture over here showing these, this area right here. And that blue area is going to be the elastic fibers. Okay? Um, then you've got the middle layer. Uh, and this is the one that's going to have a lot of smooth muscles in it. All right? Media muscles. Think, think of that way. So this is going to control the vasoconstriction, vasodilations of the blood vessels. Um, so that's where we're going to have the most muscle in the area over here. And outside of that, more superficial to that, we'll also have another layer of elastic uh, fibers there. And okay, it's kind of showing you this area right here. Okay. And then the outer layer, which is tunica adventitia versus, or the same thing is called the tunica externa. This is the part that's going to um, just and you'll see in larger vessels these things called vasovasorum. But it's the outer layer here. It's really this grayish area that's going to be mostly just connected tissue holding everything together. Um, we'll see the word vasovasorum. Vasovasorum are little blood vessels that come out of, now just listen to it, it's very similar to the coronary system. The heart is a muscle, it's tissue. So it needs nutrients, it needs oxygen. So you're going to have two blood vessels coming out of the aorta and perfusing that heart muscle. What are those two blood vessels called? Come on, you know what this is. They get blocked, you have a heart attack. Coronary. Yeah, the coronary arteries, okay? So you have the coronary arteries coming out of the aorta going into the heart muscle to give the heart muscle itself its nutrients and its oxygen. Well, all of this is tissue too, is it not? So that needs oxygen too. That needs nutrients. So we have some blood vessels. You can see them up here. You have some blood vessels coming out of the blood vessels and going right back into the tissue of the blood vessels. And those are called vasovasorum. Okay? We'll talk more about those later. All right, so arteries. Three types. Elastic, also known as conducting arteries. All right, these are thick wall. These are the ones, as I said, they're nearest to the heart. So basically, it's your aorta and its major branches. The one that's going to sustain the most blood pressure. Okay, 
to the large lumen there, as we expect, because you've got a big bowl of blood that just left the heart. So now you've got to have this aorta to be filling up with all that blood that just went in there. Okay? And it has a lot of elastic fibers there. So as soon as the, art, uh, the aorta takes in that big bolus of blood, it has a lot of elastic fibers so it could shrink or recoil back down to its size. Now that recoiling action is a marvelous thing in the aorta because what happens is as it recoils, it can't go backwards because there's an aortic valve there. So it can't go backwards. So when it recoils, it's going to use the power of the recoiling to help move it forward too. Does that make sense? Because it can't go backwards, it can only go forward. So that recoiling action helps with the projection of the blood to move forward. Okay? It, it's because of the elastic fibers that can withstand those high blood pressures. And we'll show those too. Okay? And it allows the blood to move in a very uh, continuous fashion throughout your whole body. So it's doing this kind of thing. Here's where the left ventricle is and it pushes the blood forward, it's going to stretch out here. And we could stretch this out because we have elastic fibers, right? But as elastic fibers kick in, they're going to shrink this down and recoil it down, and as it does, it's going to push the blood forward. It can't go backwards because you've got the aortic valve here. So that reaction of recoiling is going to add or contribute towards the blood moving forward. Is that clear? Okay. Then we have the muscular or distributing arteries. And these are blood vessels or arteries after the aorta. All right, so they're dis distal to the elastic artery. And these are the ones that are responsible to making sure that the blood supply goes to the many organs throughout your whole body. It has a very thick tunica media, which means that there's a lot of smooth muscles there, uh, which is why we call it the muscular arteries. There's about 25 to 40 layers of smooth muscle in this area. And this is going to be active for vasoconstriction to push the blood forward, increase blood pressure. Okay, so just showing over here, here's elastic, um, elastic artery over here, and here's the muscular artery over here. Okay, um, I'm just showing you the difference between the two. Then you have arterioles, and arterioles is the smallest set of arteries to go before we get into the capillaries. All right, um, and like small arteries, these arterioles are very capable of doing the vasoconstriction. In fact, hint, hint, most of vasoconstriction is being conducted by the arterioles more than anywhere else in the entire body. So the arterioles is the major place of where um, uh, vasoconstriction occurs. Hint, hint, you may want to make note of that, okay, should that appear on the exam, okay? That brings together some diseases. I know you've heard of these. Arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. They are not the same thing. That's why you got to hear it and spell and count some stuff because they sound very similar, but they are not the same thing. Will they lead to the same thing? Yes, but they aren't caused by the same thing. Arteriosclerosis is just a degeneration of the arteries and they're getting harder. Now that's something as we get up in age, it just gradually is going to do. Instead of them being garden hoses, they become more like lead pipes. They just don't have the capability of stretching and, and, and uh, recoiling back as much as it did in a 30-year-old uh, and these 70 or 80-year-old people. It just does that. They have a lifespan of blood vessels, is what I'm saying, before they start changing. Your blood pressure will go up when they become this lead pipe because it doesn't have the capability of moving and spreading out. It's the, the blood pressure stays within there and the blood pressure goes up. What does that mean? Well, as we get older, we will have high blood pressure. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just that the lifespan happens. I think I explained this once before. If you had a Porsche car in the field over there and it's brand new, you let it sit there for 10 years, it's going to have a good motor. Sure, no problem but those tires are going to rot. It has a lifespan. And the same way here. Now, is it the uh, foods that you eat? Can that change things about uh, the, the, uh, the making it more like a lead? I'm sure it does. It'll buy you some time. Maybe they're supposed to get hard at, I'm just giving you an example. Maybe they're supposed to get hard at, let's say, 55 years old and you eat the right foods and stuff. Now you don't get the arteriosclerosis until 65. 
You could slow the process, but it's still going to happen. Does that make sense? You could spray things on those tires of the Porsche and get an extra year or two, but there's still going to be a lifespan of the tires. You just can't do anything about it. Okay. Uh, and this, if this doesn't cor if this isn't corrected, if you don't have some kind of medication to lower the blood pressure as you get older, it's going to lead to strokes and heart attacks and high blood pressure and things like that. Okay. So there's nothing you can do about arteriosclerosis. It's just going to happen. Okay, but we also have something called atherosclerosis. This is due to cholesterol in our diet. We're seeing a lot more of it as we get further and further on. Uh, it's because of the foods that we're eating, because cholesterol tastes so damn good. All right. What will happen here is that they're going to start building plaques. When we get into the digestive system, and when you take cholesterol, they're going to show you. We're going to show you where the cholesterol goes, so you could actually get it out of your body. There's a certain type of cholesterol that goes into the walls of the blood vessels, the arteries particularly. And this, uh, as it builds up and builds up, this is called atherosclerosis. Okay? And we're getting a lot more of this as we go up in decades in terms of, at least America and other places, because of McDonald's and all these other places that are just tasting so good for people. All right? So this is basically what's happening here. This is what you want. Uh, but then you start having atherosclerosis, you start having this area here, and you can see that it's closing up the blood vessels. If it close up all the way, then that can lead to, a, obviously, a blockage. And if that's a blood vessel going to your heart, let's say your coronary artery, you get a heart attack. Okay? So um, this is just showing you what it should look like. Eventually, gradually, it's going to happen. You have these fatty streaks. Then you start having these cholesterol plaques in here. Eventually, as an advanced cloud, plaque forms, you only have this amount of blood can go through. So whenever you hear things uh, that they say, oh, you have 50% of your coronary artery blocked, that's what they're talking about. In this case, it more, looks more like uh, maybe 80% blocked. You see what I'm saying? When it's fully blocked, the blood can't get through there. Yeah? Um, I'm sorry, say it again? Have that? Vegetarians? They shouldn't, but it depends on their diet. In other words, uh, it, the question is, I guess you're asking, is atherosclerosis preventable? Right? Yes, you can. However, there are certain diseases like hypercholesterolemia, where let's say you don't have certain enzymes working in an active manner that will lead to atherosclerosis. Your body makes cholesterol, all right? And you can live off of just the endogenous cholesterol in your body, and that's fine. You need cholesterol to make steroids, as you've seen, 20% uh, the, the, uh, of all your cell walls are made up of cholesterol. You need cholesterol, but you don't need the exogenous cholesterol coming from the diet. Does that make sense? You don't need all that extra, but cholesterol tastes very good. Eat mayonnaise without cholesterol and eat mayonnaise with it, and you'll see the difference, where it, 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 it's, it's a big difference. So is it preventable? Usually yes. The arteriosclerosis is not. So yeah, if you eat healthy, sure, you can stay away from these atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic plaques. Okay? Okay? Right, you want the less cholesterol. Your body may, but it doesn't taste good. Well, I guess if you, that's all you're used to, sure, then it tastes good to you because you can't compare it to anything. But once you get the cholesterol bug, you know what it tastes like. Well, look at, when we get into di when we get to digestion, We'll talk a little bit about the nutrition facts and how that works. But yeah, you should trust them. They, because they have to run through the FDA, and the FDA has to approve everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they don't, then their company will just bottom down. All right? But there is misleading stuff, and we'll talk about that. You know, when they say that there's, uh, it's low in cholesterol, sure, it's low in cholesterol, but it doesn't tell you about the saturated fats. So it could be low in cholesterol, but very high in saturated fats, so, but they're not going to tell you about the saturated fats. They're just going to tell you that it's low in cholesterol. Does that make sense? You know, you eat Twizzlers. There's no fat in there. Yeah, there's no fat in there. It's all carbohydrates. It's all sugars. But if you don't change, the, if your body, if you eat a bag of Twizzlers and you don't go and run and burn off all those calories, those sugars that are in your body turn into fat. So it's not that they're wrong, but they're misleading. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is just showing you again in a different view. Uh, here's a, a plaque over here, and soon it starts building up. And we talked a little bit about turbulence that can happen over here. Okay, and this is showing you a, uh, uh, an actual specimen. 
there's an artery, and this area right here is a flat. That should not be there. This blood, this lumen should go out to here. Okay. This is on a, a microscopic level what the plaque would look like. Okay. So we have coronary artery disease, right? It's DAD. Can't get through uh, blood vessel, uh, you know, obstruction without talking about coronary artery disease. This is the number one cause of death in America. Okay, it has been for a number of years, at least from the 1950s, when they started finding out uh, vaccines, doing the discovery of vaccines and stuff. Before that, it was more because of uh, malaria and things like, you know, it's, uh, uh, people were dying from pneumonia and stuff. Um, but now, uh, coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death. Uh, diabetes, mellitus, is the number one risk factor for this. So if you have diabetes, you're already at risk of getting uh, heart attacks. Okay? Smoking is the number one preventable risk factor, which is why there's so many uh, places around here, it's so difficult to find a place to smoke. Okay? So again, it's narrowing of the coronary arteries due to atherosclerosis, and this could lead to something called angina pectoris. This means that it's not totally uh, a void of any uh, oxygen going through there, but the thing is, uh, it's a decrease of oxygen going to the heart muscle, and this can lead to a myocardial infarction. Um, and the person would have angina, they, they say like a chest pain. That's what's happening. They're having a heart attack, but they're having, well, you wouldn't know that, but they have angina, uh, you know, and then we can test that by doing EKG, but these can lead to myocardial infarction. So the treatment for this, TX's treatment, is lifestyle changes, right? Change the way you diet, do some exercises, stop the smoking, that kind of stuff, all right? Uh, worst case scenario, you might have to do the surgery, and then, um, well, I'll show you this. Okay. So this is a couple of surgeries that they would do. I'm going to say surgeries, a medical pr procedure is, is a kind of surgery too. So here is a plaque over here. They could actually put a uh, catheter, and at the end of the catheter, they'll have a balloon there. So what they'll do is they'll put the catheter using radiography. They can see where the catheter end is to the area where the, pl where the plaque is. And at the end, once it's there, they'll blow up the balloon and kind of push that uh, cholesterol off to the side. And that's what balloon uh, angioplasty is. It doesn't get rid of it. It's kind of like silly putty, or more like Play-Doh. And when a balloon pushes it, it pushes it off to the side. Does it mean that you're going to probably need another uh, balloon angioplasty? Yeah. Okay? It, it, it surely does, unless you're going to change your diet to get rid of those plaques. Does that make sense? We could also do something called stent placement. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. And it's, again, they're putting in a catheter in the area where this blockage is, is about. And at the end of it, it's kind of like this springing thing. And the best way I can explain it is, you've seen, um, I don't know, when you do ski ball or, or, or ski ball or whatever, and you get the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the windows, little five cent kind of things. Well, you ever see those Chinese finger uh, knock blocking things? That's similar what this is. All right, uh, but if you take a look at it, it's like a springing thing. You put it in there, and then it opens up, and the stent stays in there. So it holds it out there, as opposed to something that's just in this angioplasty, this balloon part, which just pushes off the side. This pushes off to the side, but then you're going to have something that stays there. Okay, and that's what happens with that stent placement. Again, uh, it'll stay there, but you might have other areas later on that you're going to have to get more stent placement. Okay, so those are just some ways that we can fix this. We could also do a more permanent thing, and it's the coronary artery bypass graft, or it's better known as cabbage. And what this is, is that if there's a clot there, if there's some kind of clotting mechanism going on, we're going to bypass it. That's it. A simple way that we're going to bypass it. Well, it's not simple, because we've got to do each one of these, but we're just going to bypass it. We could use a vein from the leg called the lung saphenous. We could use an artery over here called the internal mammillary, and we'll get into all those later on. Or they could just use a flexible synthetic kind of graft, something that's just uh, almost like a cloth. Uh, it's, it's synthetic. I, I, get, it's, it's, I should have brought one in. I have one at home. But it's, it's kind of like a cloth thing that, that's bendable on it. And what you're doing is, if there's a blood clot, not a blood clot, I'm sorry, if there's some kind of blockage to this artery over here, this the right coronary artery, there's some blockage happening over here, we're just going to put uh, a tube or a blood vessel going from here where the blood can go through. And over here. So we're bypassing this area. We also use the internal mammillary, which we'll talk about later, the internal mammillary artery, 
and just fly past it over here if there's a blitz clock here. See? Not a blitz clock, but a, a blockage. All right? So you can visualize. Same thing over here. The blockage is over here. We're just going to bypass it. It's a bypass. If you do that three places, we call it triple bypass surgery. If you do it five places, it's a quintuplet uh, bypass surgery. But it's very tedious because you've got to sew each part of it. You know what I'm saying? It can take, like, do a quintuple bypass surgery. That can take about six, seven hours. Does that make sense? All right? But that's what that's going on over here. All right, let's talk about veins. Questions so far? All right. All right, veins. So after this, and we'll talk about the capillaries afterwards. So what's happening over here is that you've got the venules. These are the first set of uh, receiving uh, the receiving blood vessels that have deoxygenated blood, right? So right now the capillaries took care of the gas exchange. Um, and this allows the, uh, uh, the blood to go into the veins, eventually going back to the heart, which will pump to the lungs. So veins in general, okay, they're formed when venules converge, okay, uh, and are composed of three different layers, right? Three different tunics, all right? The intima is very similar to what you just saw with arteries in general. Uh, there's a very thin tunica media, so there isn't much muscular muscle in that area that gives the flexibility more with the veins. But it has a very thick uh, tunica externa or adventitia, okay, which is connective tissue to hold the whole thing together. Okay? Now, out of all the blood in your body, if you have 100% of your blood, 65% sits in your veins. Why? Because the blood pressure is so low in the veins, it's, the blood is moving slower. So it has to have more places to go. So we're going to have more veins than arteries. But keep in mind, when blood is going through the arteries, it's going very fast. It just came from the heart. So blood doesn't sit in the arteries for very long. But by the time it's lost all its momentum, it's now sitting in the veins. So the veins are going to be holding two-thirds of all the blood in your entire body. It's a big reservoir for all your blood by the for it to get to, before it gets to your back to your heart. Alright? So yes, when we get into the names of blood vessels, you're going to find there's uh, usually, at least in the arms and the legs, there's uh, two sets of veins to compensate for all that blood that's, uh, that has uh, the blood flow going slower and all the blood pressure being low, okay? Just so you can see, I don't want to ask you about these numbers, but just so you can see it, this here, um, this is this orange area over here, this is basically your heart, and you can put this up here too. So heart and lungs is this area here. Capillaries is where it sits, but look at this blue area. This is where your blood, for 65% of it, is going to be found in the veins. Again, don't worry about too much of the percentages, except for veins carrying 65%, two-thirds of all your blood. All right? The blood pressure is very low. You could prove that by, well, I wouldn't ask you to do this, but if you cut a vein, it'll trickle down. If you cut an artery, the blood pressure is so high, it'll shoot off. All right? Veins will just trickle down because the blood pressure is so low. Don't do this at home, but just take my word for it, okay? But that's what's going on over there, all right? So like I said, the blood pressure in veins is much lower. They have thinner walls. If you think about uh, a garden hose is to an artery as a fire hose is to a vein, okay? And we have also venous sinuses. And basically, these are areas of veins that are openly, that are, uh, the, the lumen is much bigger because it's trying to hold in a lot more blood than what the arteries would. And these are called sinuses. And you've seen a sinus when we dealt with the heart, the coronary sinus. It's much bigger than all the veins. It's a place where uh, they be able to. There's a lot more sinuses also in our head. Okay? Um, so we have special adaptations to return the blood. Like I told you before, the blood pressure uh, in the veins, like where the legs are, there's gravity fighting it, so we have to have ways to get it back up to the heart. And like I said, the veins, there's, uh, there's valves in there. And the valves are going to be able to milk the blood forward. Or not milk it, but it's actually going to make sure that the blood doesn't go backwards. Okay? Um, so here's the valves. All right? So in the vein, blood goes upwards, but because the valves are here, it doesn't go backwards. It helps them bring the, the blood back up. 
all right? And we have them in veins only, okay? Um, you can also see that the legs are going to help milk the blood forward. Uh, as you walk, you're pushing the blood forward. The muscles will contract uh, when you're walking, and it's just, as a side note, it's going to push the blood, and it's going to move it forward up there, okay? This is another reason why, um, if you're on a plane for five hours from here to England, that it's good to get up, you know, every hour or so and just walk to the bathroom and come back. It's to help with making sure that the blood moves upward, that the blood isn't going to sit there for a long time and i.e. form a clot, right? And this, you can read this on your own. If you've been to England, which I have, um, these people can't move. These are the guards of the Buckingham Palace. And um, they're supposed to just be over here and not move, not smile or anything. But they have to move their leg a little bit, and you don't realize that, but they have to, otherwise you're going to faint. All right, then the blood is just going to sit there, and the blood won't be able to really get back to the heart, and you're going to faint. So they do a little moving, I'm exaggerating, but they kind of move their leg in a way that would help milk the blood forward, because they've got to do this, okay? So, brings up varicose veins, as opposed to very far veins. Anyway, um, so varicose veins is basically, for some reason, the blood pressure in the veins has been so great uh, that it actually uh, makes the valves in the veins dysfunction. They don't work well. So we have impaired valves. If you increase the blood volume, that's going to increase the venous uh, blood pressure, and those valves are not ready to take on that blood pressure, and the valves are kind of, I wouldn't say burst, but they just don't function anymore. It's a backflow of blood. And what happens is the veins start filling up with more of this blood, and the veins start getting treacherous, or torturous is a better word. They kind of move over, okay? So basically, normally blood goes through here, there's the valve, and the valve is going to prevent the blood from going backwards, but in a person where the valve is just not working, it goes up and it goes backwards. And it starts making these veins become very torturous, and you can see them in a picture like this. And that can cause some pain. You might just see an aesthetic issue, but it can cause a lot of pain. And you can also have veins that are torturous like that in the chest wall also. When the liver's not functioning, it's, it's, it's increasing the blood pressure backwards and blowing out those, those valves, and the valves aren't working. And that's what us um, varicose veins are all about. Okay? Small veins, we have an additional tunica adventitia or externa, uh, which is going to be more uh, connective tissue around there. And then you have the medium to large veins, um, and those are the ones that are going to have um, the predominant layer is going to be a much thicker uh, adventitia on there. Okay? So again, just showing you, here's a, a vein. It's kind of collapsed because it has less elasticity over here, but here's an artery. Uh, and again, this is more like a garden I'm sorry, the, a, the artery is more like a garden hose, where the vein is more like a um, fire hose. Okay? Capillaries. Now, capillaries, we, um, these are where the blood, um, the, uh, the gas exchange takes place. The walls, basically, all it is is that there's only one cell layer, which is what you would expect it to do, so the oxygen could come off very easily and carbon dioxide could come in very easily. And it allows one red blood, one red blood vessel to move uh, in a fashion. So this is a capillary. We're not going to have many blood vessels all around here like this. All right? They're not that small. You'll have one red blood vessel like this, one like this. So they're going single file so that the oxygen can come off of this quite readily and carbon dioxide can come on here quite easily too. Does that make sense? If we had it like this, then this blood vessel, or I'm sorry, this red blood cell is not going to be able to, uh, be, uh, to get the gas exchange. Here, in this setup, one red blood cell can use one side and another side to do the gas exchange. It's already built in a nice way like that. Okay? Um, so we have three different types, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, continuous, fenestrated, meaning holes, not holes, but more like windows. And then you have these sinusoidal ones. And the best way I can explain it is I have a picture to show you each one of these. But continuous is that there's uh, these cells that are over here. These are simple squamous epithelial cells.
And between the two cells, there's no gap there. They're tight to each other. So it's continuous with each other. Okay? We usually see this more in the blood-brain barrier to make sure that things cannot pass through their viruses and things like that, all right? And which also can lead to a problem because if you need to get medication into the brain, it's difficult because they're so tight over here. So pharmaceutical companies have to make sure that if we need some mental medication for schizophrenia, for bipolar, that kind of stuff, you've got to make sure that it can pass the blood-brain barrier, that it can pass through these very tight junctions over here. So yes, it's good that it's keeping viruses and bacteria out of there, but it's also a problem if you need to get drugs in there too. Okay? The fenestrated ones do have these little windows, and these are the majority that we're seeing over here. It's going to allow things to get through, especially what we see where the intestines are and where the kidneys are, so that the nutrients and other things can get through there. And sinusitis, sinusoidal is more of having a large lumen over there. Um, and we usually see that the blood moves very sluggishly, very slowly. And we see these in bone marrow and liver and in certain endocrine uh, organs. So just showing you the three types, here's where this is continuous, where there's going to be a very tight junction between the two cells. Here you have little windows to allow certain things to come through. Okay? Or you have these big or large windows, the large fenestrated ones, to allow these bigger things to go through. So there's three different uh, types of capillaries, depending on how they're all set up. And you can see them on these, these pictures here first. Okay. Capillaries are all together. We have something called a capillary bed. And this is going to help to control and to shunt blood from one place to another. Meaning that if you're getting chased by a bear, I don't need my blood to be refusing and absorbing all the nutrients from my digestive system. I need that blood flow to be shunted towards the skeletal muscles so I can get the heck out of there. Does that make sense? So this is where it's going to happen. We have to shunt the blood. How do you make it so there's less blood going to the digestive system and going more towards your skeletal muscles? And when you're sleeping, you don't need the blood to all go to your skeletal muscles. You need to go to be digesting food, right? So that's what this is all about, all right? So the network of capillaries, and it consists of a few different things. Now I'm just going to label what these things are by just verbalizing it, but the picture will be worth a thousand words. All right? We have this vascular shunt that is made up of uh, a met arteriole, but we have these sphincters that are going to control blood to go through. Let me actually let me just go right to it. All right. Uh, all right, so this is what's happening here. It's easier. So blood is going through here, through the arterial, carrying oxygenated blood. All right? Now, the blood can go into this capillary bed, which is all this. But let's say this capillary bed is going to the digestive system. And we don't need blood going to the digestive system to absorb all those uh, digested foods to get absorbed. We don't need to digest food when a bear is chasing you, okay? Or when you're taking one of my exams. Whenever you're stressed, if you're not stressed when you're taking my exam, it's easy, all right? But we've got to shun blood. So how do they do this? Well, you have these, uh, this passageway going from an arterial, um, oxygenated blood over here to deoxygenated blood over here. So here's your venous system. We have a met arterial here. And at the met arterial, there's capillaries, uh, or sorry, pre-capillary sphincters around there. So what happens here is that we don't want blood to go here. So these pre-capillary sphincters are going to tighten up so that the blood can't go into the capillary bed. All right? So it does this. This is the only animation I could do for this PowerPoint. So keep an eye on here. Watch what happens when we tighten up these pre-capillary sphincters. Bam. You see what happens? The blood, so you're, sh you're now control, you're now tightening this so that blood can't get into this capillary bed. That's the met arterial that has these, these pre-capillary sphincters. Then you're going to have, let me go back to that for a moment, then you have this through, um, through where fair, or I'm sorry, th uh, third, Thoroughfare, thoroughfare channel. All right. 
and it goes down here. So the blood will go that way. When we go back to this, now the blood can only go one way to here. You can't go backwards. It's only going to go forward into here. Does that make sense? That's what happens when blood needs to be shunted. You have these pre-capillary sphincters that tighten up to shunt the blood going in a different direction. Okay? And this happens all the time. In fact, this happens in your digestive system during stress. And you feel that. You ever get those butterflies in your stomach? That's what's happened. The, sh the, the blood is being shunted away from your digestive system whenever you get excited. Right? You haven't seen your boyfriend or girlfriend for a year. Get those jittery... That's what's happening. You get one of my exams and like you don't have any answers to the, to the question. You're, you're like going blank. So you start getting those butterflies in your stomach so the blood gets shunted away from that area to go more towards your brain to try and turn on certain interneurons so you can think of what the answer is. That's what that is. Okay?